Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence this morning, God. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you that all you need is our yes and our surrender, God. And as we sang earlier, Lord, it is your breath. You breathe life into us. And it is that very life that even enables us and empowers us to glorify your name, to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. And it is through your presence, God, that we can stand and say as children of God, we have no fear, for you are with us, and you promise to never leave us or forsake us. And it is through that same life that we can sing in a return of gratitude towards you for what you have done for us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, we want to lift up, continue to lift up the church of Afghanistan to you, God. The second fastest growing church in the world is being aided by the number one growing church in the world, the most persecuted church in the world, Iran. And Father, though there are reports that there are many roadblocks, including possibly even from our own government, to seeing people released. Father, we rejoice in the reports from Christians who are over in the surrounding area that you are doing the miraculous. You are waking people up in the middle of the night, telling them to go to a specific location at a specific time where they find that they can cross into freedom. No one there, God. Others are going to the, to the gates and they're seeing them blocked and they're hearing you speak in an instant. Turn to your right and go immediately. And they go and they find entrance into freedom. Father, may that be a picture to us that when you speak to us to respond immediately in obedience where we may find our freedom, God. So, Father, would you continue to protect and shield your people, God, and make provision for them. Some have to walk through, God. Give them what they need, Lord Jesus, to endure and to run the race faithfully to the end. May we not fail in lifting them up before you, God, in interceding for them. Thank you that you are our provision, God, that you are faithful. So Father, I pray that you would continue your presence with us this morning, God. We thank you for our missionaries, God. Father, we pray for a greater anointing, Lord, over Gary and Penny, God. Father, I pray that this time here, Heavenly Father, be a time of rest in your presence, God. Father, you are our provider, God. I pray that you would meet their needs in abundance. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. We are not a children of scarcity, God, but of great abundance because you are our Father. And so, Father, I pray that you would meet every need that they have, financially, physically, spiritually, emotionally, God. May this be a great time of rest and a great time of greater equipping, Lord, for what you are going to do in that work that you're continuing through them when they return back to their mission field. Father, may they be encouraged by your presence today. We may, be, we, may we be encouraged by the words that they share, Lord, that come from you. So anoint their lips, Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, be a filter in their mind to speak the things that you have for them to speak. 
give us hearts that receive your truth and respond obediently in an immediate response, God. For it is in your name we pray. We commit this hour and consecrate it to you. The name that is above all names and that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. King Jesus, we submit to you now in your name. Amen. Well, greetings in Jesus' name. Woo, you guys sound like Zambians. <laughs> Yeah, you know, when we stand before a, a group to preach or teach or whatever or to share, you must give a greeting. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody says, Amen. That's right. That's very wonderful. Well, it's a joy to be with you. Thank you for uh, inviting us and letting us come and share what God is doing in the heart of Africa. And uh, I can tell you I'm pretty excited this morning because... My worship band in, in Lusaka, we sing that Alpha and Omega song. So we're sitting over there thinking, hey, I feel like I'm back at Wood <laughs> in Lusaka right now. And uh, so it's a joy to be with you. You know what? We've been traveling, uh, well, a lot of places here over the last several months. We arrived in April. We returned back to Zambia in December of this year. And, uh, of course, we're on the eastern Michigan district this week. But... Um, it's just a, a joy to see uh, and, and share what God is doing. And, and we were, well, down in Ohio here speaking and, uh, uh, a couple months ago. And I had a church contact me you know, a few weeks in advance. And they said, now, uh, Gary, you're coming to our church to share. And is there, the, the month you're here, we're, we're going through the book of Jonah. It, is there any way you could speak on the book of Jonah when you come to our church? And I'm thinking, well, I'm supposed to be sharing about Zambia and Africa. And he says, the week you'll be here, you'll be speaking on Jonah chapter 2. And if you know Jonah chapter 2, it's when he's in the belly of the fish. These are the words of his prayer in the belly of the fish. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. And from the depths of the grave, I called for help. You listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very hearts of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Sounds like a great place to pray right there. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. And his prayer goes on. And as I read that, I'm like, Lord, what am I going to do with that? I mean, I'm supposed to talk about Zambia and Africa. And, you know, I was about to tell that pastor, I don't think I can do it. But then the Lord said to me, wait a minute, Gary. The story of Jonah is a mission story. It's my mission because I love people everywhere, even in the heart of Africa. Now, I did confess to that church when I stood up before them and say, look, I have nothing to offer you about what it's like to be in the belly of a fish. I really have no idea, no concept, but I do know this. What the story tells us is that God is everywhere. And the second thing we can learn from that passage is that no matter where you are, no matter what your circumstance, God can hear your prayer. Isn't that good news? Wow. The Zambia South District Superintendent, he called me into his office one day and he said, Hey, Reverend Gary, he goes, look at this letter that I've received. And he handed me this letter and I began to read it. And at the very top of the letter, it started this way. It says, I hope... I'm writing to the right people. Isn't that a great way to start a letter? You guys write letters like that? I hope I'm writing to the right people. And as I begin to read this letter, this man was writing. He says, I'm reading this magazine about this church. He goes, it's a holiness church. And he goes, I'm telling you, if you are the people, I want to invite you to my village. My people need this church. We need this message. Will you come? And I, I asked the district superintendent, and I said... I said, this village or wherever, I said, has our church been there? We're there, whatever. He goes, oh, no, Reverend Sida, we've never been in those areas. The very remote. 
And I'm like, hmm. And as I continued to read, over and over, he says, I hope you're the right people. And at the bottom of the letter, it said, the magazine that I'm reading from is called Herald of Holiness. Now, if you've been in the Church of Nazarene a long time, you would know that Herald of Holiness was a magazine, a periodical that we put out for a long time. But it's been, what, more than 20 years or more ago since it was out? I mean, it's called Holiness Today now. And, um, but then I got to thinking, wait a minute, we don't send the Herald of Holiness magazine to that part of the world. Wait a minute, how did that magazine make its way out to this remote village there in Zambia? Here is a man who can read in English, who is reading the magazine, and then he writes a letter, I hope I'm writing to the right people, and somehow this letter makes its way where it's supposed to go to the district office, and there we are reading the letter. Can anyone explain how that happens? Let me ask you this morning, how many of you believe that with God, all things are possible. Do you believe that? With God, all things are possible? Well, I didn't think much of that after, uh, after reading the letter. I, I thought it was amazing that a magazine made its way out to some place that we don't even send the magazine to that area. But Penny and I, we, uh, we are involved with the Extension Education Program. I'm the field education coordinator for the three countries of Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. And currently we have just over 400 in our training program, the many who have calls to be pastors and leaders in the church. And so Penny teaches Christian education and Bible courses. I teach theology and leadership and those type of courses. And we had a, a student coming through our course of study. His name was Francis. And he was coming through the course of study. He had a call to be a pastor. And he was working in a, a local church there in Lusaka. And um, he calls me up one day and he says, Reverend Seidel, I need to come and see you right away. I said, sure, Francis, come on over. So he comes over to my house. And we went around to the building in the back we have where, where our office is. And went back there. We went in the office. And as I began to talk with Francis, Francis says, Reverend Seidel, I just wanted you to come to tell you that God is telling me to go to eastern Zambia. I said, okay, Francis, that's great. I said, well, when do you think you're going to go? He says, I'm going next week. I said, you mean to visit? What are, no, no, I'm taking my family. We're going to go next week to eastern Zambia. I said, well, wait a minute, Francis. I said, you haven't finished your course of study, and, 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 and uh, shouldn't we get with the district superintendent? You know, I'm thinking of logistics and all that. And, and he said, oh, Reverend Seidel, the reason I came to see you is because I am afraid to go. He says, you know where I'm going to go. You, there's I am going to face opposition. And you've heard of some of this opposition just as I heard through the prayers today that you're hearing around the world. And, and he says, Reverend Seidel, would you pray that God would give me courage to go? Because we all know that there's one word that describes the biggest hindrance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we sang about it. Fear. Fear is why we struggle to cross the street to tell somebody about Jesus. Or, or to tell that family member or that co-worker. Or sometimes to go all around the world someplace where God may say go. And let me tell you, I know about fear. I was a rock and roll drummer. Touring. When I was 20, 21 years old, I had long hair. Okay, use your imagination today. <laughs> I had long hair, okay? I'm playing rock music. God gets a hold of me. And as soon as I get saved, God begins to deal with me about being a missionary. And I began to run from God just like Jonah. Because I knew that if I would say yes to being a missionary, he would send me to some place like... Africa. <laughs> and oh, how silly. If you've ever been to Africa, some of you may have been there. I mean, the people are awesome. God has tremendous people in amazing places, places you've never heard of, names you can't even pronounce, but God is there. And Penny and I have been honored for almost 20 years to be serving in the heart of Africa. And I prayed... For Francis, I prayed that God would give him courage to go. But as I prayed for Francis there that day in my office, 
I begin to think, Lord, would I go? Would I take my family and go? Because see, where Francis was going to go, there was no church. There was no house or parsonage to live in. There was no salary waiting on him. Nothing. And yet he was willing to take his family and go. And that next week, they went. A couple months went by, we heard nothing. I asked the district superintendent, I said, have we heard from Francis? I mean, what's going on? He goes, oh, no, we haven't heard anything. Three months, four months, five months, six months. I kept asking, where is he? What's going on? Why isn't he calling? I said, can't we send somebody? What are... The district superintendent said, we have no idea where he is at. We have heard nothing. Eight months goes by. Finally, the district superintendent calls me up and he says, Reverend Seidel, I just want you to know that Francis is sitting here in my office and wants to see you. I said, he's here in Lusaka. He goes, yeah. I said, I'll be right over. I remember I went over there, walked into the district superintendent's office. There's Francis. He's in a suit and tie looking really good, you know. And I said, Francis, I said, are, are, are you okay? I said, your family's okay? What's going on? And he says, yeah, we're okay, Rev. Now, you know when you're concerned about somebody and then you find out they're okay, what's the next thing you do? Yeah. Hey, 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 what? You can't do this. You can't. We need to know what's going on. He said, oh, Reverend Seidel, I just come to let you know that we have nine new churches out in that area. I said, how many, Francis? He said, we've got nine new churches out there. He goes, we've got people to baptize. People want to join the church. He goes, we've got leaders to develop and train. He goes, can you help us? And I'm like, well, sure. Nine new churches in less than a year. Mm. With God, all things are possible. I can tell you today that we got Francis ordained. <laughs> we finished him up. We got him a cell phone. Okay? <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I called him up a couple of weeks before we were going to go out and do training. I called him up and I said, Francis, we're all excited to come and, and uh, just want to know if there's any last minute instructions. He goes, oh, Reverend Seidel, I forgot to tell you on the Sunday you're going to be here, you'll be preaching at one of our new churches there. I said, well, that's fine, Francis. He says, you're going to be preaching at Magazine Church of the Nazarene. <laughs> I said, Francis, what's the name of the church? He said, Magazine Church of the Nazarene. I remember I hung up and all of a sudden, I remembered that letter that had come years and years before. We drove out 12 hours to get there to where he's at. Horrible roads everything, got out there, there was a crowd waiting on us, they were singing and dancing, they were so excited we had come. As I talked to Francis, one of the first questions I said to him, I said, Francis, I, got, I need to ask you, where am I preaching at Sunday morning? He says, you're going to be preaching at Magazine Church of the Nazarene, one of our new churches out here. I said, Francis, I mean, I knew because, see, when we're when we're in Africa, when we go out to like these places, we have churches out there that are called Chikumbi. Napunwe, you know, African names. Magazine Church of the Nazarene. I said, Francis, how did you get this name? He goes, oh, Reverend, you know we used to be a British colony. And I said, well, yeah. He said, well, the British had a fort out here called Fort Smith. I said, oh, yeah, I remember, yeah. He said, well, outside the fort area there, they had an ammunition factory that made magazines for guns. So that whole area out there is known as magazines. And I'm like, oh, well, there goes my connection to my letter. <laughs> but not really, because see, God knew years before that he would send the magazine that we don't send to Africa. And somehow it would make its way to a village where a man who would pray, he would say, bring the church, Lord. Bring somebody to bring this message. And there would be someone like a Francis who would answer that call, take his family and go when there's nothing out there. And he would go. I'll tell you today, Francis has more than 20 churches in that area. And he's now heading up a Jesus film team. Why? Because with God, all things are possible. As a matter of fact, we've been speaking uh, since April. We've been traveling around, and uh, and I even got an email here 
from one of our leaders in the north, our district superintendent. This is the kind of letters I get because I'm the field education coordinator. I mean, we're using technology. We're almost daily on our WhatsApps and all kinds of things, you know, with our people on the, on the field. And, and I get this one. Here's from our district superintendent. Reverend Seidel, just wanted you to know that Reverend Matombo and I have been meeting with key leaders now in Kasama in the northern part of Zambia. He says, we have leaders coming. Now, these are new churches, new people. that I don't even know who they are yet. He says, and he get, has a whole list of talent towns and villages where the new churches have started. And he says, these people are crying that they are to be trained and equipped. He says, as you can see, this area is about 800 kilometers away from the district office. 800 kilometers is about 500 miles. I don't even know where 500 miles would be from here. Maybe it'd be like Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. But let me tell you, there is no I-75 in where I live. I mean, you don't just get on the highway or get on a plane or whatever. I mean, there are times when I get reports. They'll say, they'll say hey, Reverend Seidel, just want you to know we have five new churches in this area. And I'm like, well, where is this at? And when they get out a map, it looks like this. There it is right there. Can't you see it? I'm like, well, there's nothing there. I mean, how did you get there? They said, well, let's see, we, we were on a bus for a while, we rented a taxi, got on a motorcycle. Uh, there was one report that said the last 60 kilometers we had to ride oxen and cart to get there. I can see some of you are ready to sign up and come, right? Doesn't that sound like fun? 40 miles of riding on an oxen and cart, you know, to get out to where you're going to go. Okay, this is what God is doing with amazing people like Francis and others. And so he says, as you can see, God is opening doors as we are seeing new churches opening up each month and there's the great need for training to occur. As I'm running around in the U.S., let me tell you, God is not limited by a pandemic. God is still doing amazing things. And Penny's going to come and she's going to share here a little bit more about what God is doing. Some amazing new ministries we got going on as well. Good morning. It's great to be here with you this morning. And um, just before I share, I uh, just want you to know in the foyer, we do have a display table set up so you can see some things from Zambia. And we also have our prayer cards, and I know they're kind of sad. We have no children on our prayer card. <laughs> this is the first prayer card without our children, but we would appreciate if you would pick up a prayer card and remember to pray for us. Uh, all of our children are grown up, and they're back here in the States and going to school. And um, our oldest daughter is uh, married and started a family, and so God is taking care of them. But um, we do ask that you would continue to pray for Zambia and Africa Southeast Field. Gary mentioned the three countries, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi. That's where we are. We work in all three of those countries. Um, as he mentioned, he is the field education coordinator. He's also work and witness coordinator and um, working in all three of the countries. I'm children's ministries coordinator for those three countries and working with the districts and teaching and training and um, working um, with the local churches to develop children's ministries. I also work in Zambia, uh, Nazarene Compassionate Ministries Child Sponsorship, if you're familiar with that, sponsoring pastor's kids to go to school for grades 1 to 12. I oversee that. For Zambia, we have uh, right at 300 children in that program. They don't all have a sponsor at this time, but they're there. And... Um, God is blessing and he's providing ways for, for children to go to school and get an education. We even um, have some children that have went through the program and God has provided means. And we have policemen, we have nurses, we have teachers. And one of our young guys is now in engineering school. So we're excited that um, God is working in ways and helping these young people to receive an education so they can help their families and the church um, so it's it's exciting to know what God is doing. Um, we also have, um, with the pandemic, you know, we had problems just like everybody. And so we had to close down our child development centers for a period of time because the children couldn't come into the local churches. 
and um, they come before school or after school and receive a hot meal and help with tutoring and uh, spiritual devotion, singing, all kinds of things are provided, sports uh, for these children at these centers. And these are just orphans and vulnerable children in the local community. It's not limited to just the church children, but anybody in that community can come and be a part of the Child Development Center. Um, so when the pandemic happened and the government said you can't meet and you can't have all these kids here, uh, they started sending things home with the kids. They provided the children with masks and hand sanitizer and soap and uh, a little bit of food and took those to the homes so the children and their families could stay safe. And that was part of the things that we did um, during the pandemic. But one of the things that I would like to share with you um, right now is one of our, our ministries that we are calling in Africa, Orality. Now, you know, Africa is all over Africa. We are doing this ministry. There are very oral cultures. And we tell stories, and they pass stories down from generation to generation. And so Gary is holding up what is called the Bible story cloth. This is the Old Testament story cloth. So this has 50 stories from the Old Testament. And so you can see the bright pictures and this is a cloth that can be worn around like a skirt, like I'm wearing this Chitenge <laughs> skirt. So I'm not wearing that one because I'm wearing this one. Um, but you can wear that as a skirt. You can wrap it around your neck as a scarf. And when people see the beautiful pictures, the, this is an opportunity. They ask, wow, what is that? And then you can share, well, let me share a story with you. And so what we're doing in orality is we are learning these stories and hiding them in our heart so that we can just freely share the word of God because it's easier to tell a person a story than it is to say let me give you the three points to salvation remember that fear word but if we're sharing something that happened something that we know that is part of us that is in our heart we freely tell stories all the time if you see me after church I can tell you many stories about this new grandbaby that we have Okay, I have lots of Naomi stories. Okay, we, you know, we want to talk. We want to share things that are important to us that are in our life. So why not the word of God? We hide the word of God in our hearts and we can freely share that with others. So orality is a way we are doing that. We, in the Africa region, when we sent out our 2021 Sunday school curriculum, they included a page that's just orality. So the Sunday school teacher can either teach the regular curriculum the way they want to, or they can take that scripture or those objectives and tell the story. What is the Bible story that comes from that scripture and just share that story and ask questions related to that story? It's just an easier way. It's just a different way that we can share. Our Jesus film teams are learning the 13 stories from the book of Luke, which are in the Jesus film. When they do their follow-up the next day after they show the film, they will go to people who have said they, they asked Jesus to come into their heart. They'll go over those stories and start telling those stories and reminding them what they saw in the Jesus film. We have a discipleship plan with orality. We have 44 stories that go with the 16 articles of faith. Who we are as Nazarenes, what do we believe, and why do we believe these things? We have stories. We can just freely share that, teaching people, bringing them in, discipling them, helping them to grow spiritually through storytelling. And so what we're doing is we're recording these stories on devices in the local language. So it's almost like a hotspot. You can go to the marketplace or anywhere and turn this thing on. And when people come in with their cell phones, we have lots of cell phones in Africa, and they start browsing, is there any Wi-Fi here? They can connect to your device. Well, instead of being able to go on Facebook and places like that and post things, they're going to see all the Bible stories that you have recorded on that device. They're going to see it in their own language. They can download those onto their phone and have them in their own language so they can learn them and share them with others. And it goes on and on and on. The more we share, the more others are going to learn the word of God and share it with others. We're also putting these scriptures to Psalms. We're putting scriptures to song because we know it's easier to remember something in a song sometimes than it is to 
just remember the words of that verse. So we're putting them to, to song in the local languages. So we're going to give you a sample here. And the sample is going to come from James 1.22, which says this. James 1.22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So we're going to go ahead and play that little audio clip right now. Listen, listen to the word. So that's the English version, and what we do is we translate that into the different languages. Now we have 72 different languages in Zambia alone. We have about nine base languages which we target, and so I'm working with my team because uh, we recorded that at my house. I have a little portable recording set up and, and uh, bring all those singers and musicians in. Of course, I have a great opportunity of actually songwriting with Zambia artists, uh, gospel artists, and so you can see more of that on the table back there. But um, anyway, uh, it's an exciting opportunity. But you know, isn't it exciting? You can put these songs on your cell phone. You can go on down through the day, listen to James 122, you know. And uh, because we all know the power of music, don't we? The power of music where, you know, you're going through your week, you remember a worship song, you remember maybe a song you heard on radio, whatever, and, uh, and, th and that power is there. And so we use that as a way to disciple people so that they can hide the Word of God in their hearts and their minds so that they can honor God. Amen? Pretty exciting. I want to close with a story that is exciting to me that tells the story that with all things, with God, all things are possible. I, one of my first assignments was to go with the Jesus Film team. Now, if you've heard about the Jesus Film ministry, it's still a viable ministry in uh, like Zambia. We have 16 teams showing across Zambia right now, planning churches and discipling. And so they asked me to take a team to remote Zambia there. And so loaded up my vehicle, took off that day, drove all day. It was a horrible drive. I was physically exhausted when I got there because the roads were so bad at the time. But anyway, the next day we got up at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we went out to a soccer field. Because everybody knows the number one sport in Africa is football. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and so uh, you can go into the most remote areas of, of like Zambia and you'll find soccer field, okay? And so we went out on this soccer field about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We began to set up the Jesus Film equipment. And within about uh, 30 minutes, we already had about two to 300 people. By three hours later, 6 o'clock, we're ready to start the Jesus Film. That entire soccer field from goalpost to goalpost was completely filled with people as we began the Jesus film. I'm looking at this whole thing and I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. No advertising, no radio announcements. I mean, we just show up and boom, thousands appear. And you know, I remembered when I was a pastor in West Virginia, you know, about these reports. You remember those reports? Millions of viewers and all these kind of statistics. And I thought to myself, hmm, I asked the team leader, I said, I know you got to fill out all those reports. I said, this is amazing. I said, I just got to ask you, how do you count all these people to fill out your report? The team leader looks at me. He says, well, tonight, Reverend, you're going to count. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I said, I want to know how you do it. He goes, no, grab your torch, your flashlight, let's go. <laughs> so there we went walking around this soccer field. And if you've ever seen the Jesus Film ministry, I mean, the only light in the entire area is the dim light coming off the screen. And I mean, the people are packed in both sides of the screen like sardines in a can. And of course, I mean, you can see from either side. I mean, I kind of jokingly say, right hand Jesus this side, left hand Jesus if you're watching from this side. But I mean, they're packed in there, and I'm trying to count them. I'm like, 500, 500, 500. I mean, I'm like, I don't know. And as I was trying to count, all of a sudden the grass behind me began to make noises and there was this tall grass around the field and I took my flashlight and began to poke it through the grass back through here and this grass was completely filled with people who were looking out the grass watching the Jesus film. Went down to this end of the field by the goal post and I'm still trying to figure out how to count everybody. And there was a big row of trees right through here and I 
took my flashlight and began to go up across those trees and they were completely filled with people who had climbed up and they were watching the Jesus film. Went down around to the other end of the field down by this goal post and I had no idea what I was going to do here. But all I can tell you is I looked, I got to watching this row of buildings that was a short distance away and as I got to watching, I could see that the roofs of those buildings were completely filled with people who had climbed up and they were watching the Jesus film. And I knew they could see because we had a big screen and I know we had these big bullhorn speakers. And so I asked the team leader, I said, now if I'm supposed to give you a number, am I supposed to include the people in the grass and up in the trees and over on the roofs and all that? I said, should I include them? Because I know they can see and hear. He said, oh no, Rev, because let's just count the, let's just count the people right here on the soccer field. I have to tell you, I never did give him a number. How could you? It, it would have been a pure guess. It would have been some thousands of something. But I do know this. At the end of that film, when they gave the invitation to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, I saw people coming from grasses, trees, I don't care. They came in from all directions. And I mean, they were followed up. They had people down there with tablets, taking names, writing as fast as they could so they could do follow-up the next day. I mean, what an amazing sight to see people standing in line just simply to tell somebody, I have received Christ as my Lord and Savior. Isn't that amazing? We would stand in line to do that. That Sunday morning, I had the opportunity to preach at that new preaching point where we were at. and we, A lot of our churches meet in school classrooms. I mean, probably not much bigger than this section right here. I mean, you can get, what, two, three hundred right here in this section? Yeah, come on, I, you can squeeze them in there. You know, and so I had the opportunity as I finished preaching, I remember we didn't have an altar or anything. We just had concrete floors. And at the end, we were praying. People were receiving Christ. And I mean, people were knelt all over the place. And I prayed with quite a few people. And after I finished, I remember I went back in the corner and sat down in the chair. And as I did, back over here was a woman that was knelt down. And the team leaders, the, the pastor of that new preaching point, the district superintendent who had went with us, they're all over around this woman. And I mean, they've got their hands on this woman. And I mean, they're praying and it's getting louder and more intense. And I mean, you could tell that something was going on. This superintendent, he jumps up and runs over to me and he says, hey, Reverend, he goes, you know what's going on here? I said, well, I'm not sure. And before he could say much, this woman, she jumps up and you can see tears coming down her cheeks. And she begins to speak in her language of Chichewa. And she begins to tell that church that day that she is a devil worshiper. And she said, the devil told her to come to this precise location because there's a new church that's trying to come in, a holiness church, and we don't want that kind of church in our area. Go and destroy that church. And so she had come that day to destroy the church. But God had a different plan. Because that morning, she found Jesus as her Lord and Savior. As a matter of fact, six months later, we went back to do follow-up with the church. I remember the church service had started. We walked in. And guess who was up front as the psalm worship leader? I said, Pastor, I said, isn't that the devil worship lady? <laughs> and he says, oh, let me tell you about this woman. She is on fire for Jesus. He, that was his exact words. He goes, she's on fire for Jesus. He says, let me tell you, this entire region has heard the story of how a devil worshiper has been changed into a child of God. He says, every... He said, every Sunday, he says, we have new visitors coming into this church because of her testimony. And you know, as I think about it, when I think of the story of Jonah, I wonder how many people passed by that woman, maybe even Christians, who said, hey, hey, shh, shh, hey. careful, she's a devil worshiper. Stay away. Hmm? I wonder how many. But I'm telling you what this shows me is that with God, all things 
It's possible because if God, you know, the, the, the story says, whoever you're praying for, I want you to know if you're praying for somebody, don't give up hope. Because if God can change a devil worshiper into a child of God, who are you praying for? What is it he can't overcome? Don't give up praying. We have the greatest hope in the world. And that's why you send missionaries. That's why you pray and give. And we are telling you this morning, thank you, thank you, thank you for praying and for giving. And if you were there that Sunday morning, you would have heard her singing a song that goes something like this. It's a worship song we sing all over Africa in all the languages. In English, it sounds like this. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. Very simple. Let's see if we can sing it. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. You know what? You're starting to sound like Zambians right now. But we have a huge problem. You don't look Zambian at all. Because when we're singing that song, we're usually standing and clapping our hands. So you think you could try it? Let's try it. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. You know what? Okay, you're doing so well with that. Let's go to the second part of the song where we dance and move like we do in Africa. What are you laughing at? Okay, here goes the second part. The second part says, I'm walking, walking, here, there. Because everyone knows the main form of transport in Africa is walking. So I'm walking, walking, here, there. Then it says, I'm searching, searching, here, there. Now, when we're singing it in our churches, like in Zambia, we're checking under the chairs, the benches. <laughs> I mean, if, check under the shirt. I don't know. You know whatever you got to do. We just want to make sure that there's no one there's no one like Jesus. So I'm searching, searching here, there. Then I turn around here, there. There's no one. There's no one like him. Why, why do I see doubt on some of your faces? <laughs> hey, church is supposed to be a place of encouragement. Look to somebody next to you and say, I know you can do this song. Yeah. Here we go. There's no one. There's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. I'm walking, I'm walking, walking here, there. I'm searching, searching here, there. I turn around here, there. There's no one, there's no one like him. You know, I give yourself a hand. You did very well. You may be seated. I always tell a lot of churches, just keep working on that. You'll get it all figured out. I can see the song leaders over here taking notes, you know, like, okay, let's, you can do that song. <laughs> well, those are the kind of songs that we sing in Africa. Those aren't children's church songs. Those are our main worship songs. Of course, I always say that if you see the videos of Africa, you know we like to sing and dance and move. And when you use a lot of motion, you have to have a lot of emotion too, you know. So uh, it's an exciting place. Well, we're going to close with a video. And as we watch the video, I hope it'll just show a little bit more what we're doing there in the heart of Africa. But let me just say this. We did not come here today to share our story, like Gary and Penny to share our story. No, what we're sharing today is our story. Because as I say, as we pray, as we give, you know, God puts us where he wants us. But it takes all of us working together. And so we want to say thank you, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your giving.